Our first scripture lesson today is from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 9. Listen for the word of the Lord. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you who are being protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, even if now for a little while you've had to suffer various trials so that the genuineness of your faith, being more precious than gold, that, though perishable, is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Although you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy, for you are receiving the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. A reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 19 to 31. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors were locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. The word of the Lord. Well, late on Wednesday afternoon this past week, I was standing outside Chris's office And I was talking to both Paul and Chris about how whenever it's my turn to preach, my least favorite part about putting the liturgy together is deciding what to title the sermon. My deadline to get everything together and into planning center, which is the application we use for worship planning, was at midnight, so I was running out of time. Choosing a sermon title is usually the last thing I do. I even finish the prayers and decide on the hymns and the traditional service before my sermon gets a title. Part of the reason I drag my feet is I don't want the title of a sermon to limit my writing in any way. I don't want it to confine the words that I put down on the page. Like sometimes I get to typing and the Holy Spirit moves me in a completely new direction from whenever I first opened my laptop. And so I don't want to end up in a situation where I've titled my sermon something and it doesn't make any sense once I get to the delivery of the sermon. I jokingly say that sometimes I want to title all of my sermons with just the word sermon and nothing else. So I was driving home from work later that day thinking about this passage and trying to come up with something and then it hit me. What if I just give the sermon for this week a title that fits the day? What if I were to just keep it simple? And that's how we ended up with our sermon title this morning, The Sunday After Easter Sunday. (laughs) Super straightforward. 
After all, this is the passage that we traditionally read on the Sunday after Easter Sunday, the Sunday after we celebrate the power of resurrection. In fact, every year, John 20, 19 to 31, is read in pulpits across the country on this day. Not just in Presbyterian churches, but any congregation that follows the lectionary will be hearing about doubting Thomas. You know, Thomas, the faithless skeptic who, was mainly, who we mainly just talk about on this particular day, he was a devoted disciple of Jesus, yet this is kind of his legacy in a weird way. There are all sorts of paintings and other artwork, too, depicting this passage. So why is it so important? Why do we spend so much time talking about it? And why do we give poor old Thomas such a hard time? It's a pretty straightforward passage on the surface. Thomas was the one disciple who is not with the others when Jesus appears to them, and after they tell Thomas that we have seen the Lord, he responds by saying that unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. Then, of course, Jesus appears and says, put your finger here and see my hands, and then reach out your hand and put it in my side, and, Thomas tells, and, and he tells Thomas, do not doubt, but believe. Thomas then answers him, my Lord, my God. And then Jesus says to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. I feel like I kind of see where Thomas is coming from in a way. I could be a bit of a skeptic by nature. I like science. I like statistics. I like the cold, hard facts. I want proof. I want physical evidence. And so if someone came up to me and said they had witnessed something that defies all expectations, logic, and understanding, I'd want to see too in order to believe what I'm being told. It could be hard for me to just take someone's word for it if it doesn't make sense. And so I wonder if I too would have responded like Thomas. Perhaps that's why we spend so much time on this text, that we too can see ourselves in the story, that there are times where it's hard to believe, that there are times in life where it's difficult to keep the faith, when we aren't presented with all of the information that we think we need, that sometimes it's hard to trust, it's hard to keep the faith. Funny, isn't it, when you look at the big picture of this gospel narrative and when you look at our Christian calendar, just one week after all of the grandeur and celebration of resurrection power, here we are again, back in our world full of doubts and fears. We witnessed the power of resurrection just one week ago, and then we go right back into our old ways of doing things. I know I'm not the only one in the sanctuary who has felt that feeling of coming down from the mountaintop. Whether we were on fire after a weekend at Presbyterian pilgrimage or another retreat or worship on a specific Sunday, we know what it's like to come down from the mountain. I just experienced it. I, I went to this conference for Presbyterian pastors in their first five years of ministry a few weeks ago. It gave me all sorts of tools, new strategies, and encouragement to continue serving in my call. And I left feeling refreshed and ready to hit the ground running. I felt that new life. Then as soon as I was hit with the big wave of Holy Week and a very few busy weeks of ministry, at times it felt like I was slowly creeping back down the mountain. It's not like I'd forgotten everything I'd learned during the mountaintop moment or lost all hope, but it's a little bit harder to feel that on-fire feeling from a few weeks ago. So what do we do when that happens? What do we do when the storms of life get in the way of experiencing new life again and again each week? I've shared before about how I became fascinated with weather as a little kid and how that eventually led me to study meteorology in my first couple of years at Texas A&M and how it all started 
uh, from my experiences as a little kid. In 1997, there was a monster F5 tornado that decimated the town of Gerald, Texas, about 40 miles north of Austin. And since I grew up in San Antonio, about 100 miles south of Gerald, seeing the videos of the Twister on TV really freaked me out because I knew how close that was. I had lots of family in Dallas, and I knew they had tornadoes there, but something about this one happening so much further south, it just felt a little too close to home. Of course, tornadoes can happen anywhere, but they happen with less and less frequency the further south you get in Texas. We've had them in San Antonio, but they are much more likely than they are here in Dallas. And so after witnessing that monster tornado on TV on that same night, as the storm system reached our area, a bolt of lightning struck a really large tree in our backyard, leading the tree to collapse. It scared me half to death, and I remember being terrified. I was left wondering, are we going to be okay? I thought surely a tornado was next, and up into the sky, me and my family would go. Of course, we turned out okay, but I was forever left with a new fascination, but also a new fear, tornadoes. Of course, moving to Dallas would mean that I now have the regular opportunity to face this fear. <laughs> in October of 2019, I was with my wife at my in-law's house in North Dallas, where a supercell sprouted seemingly out of nowhere and the sirens went off. The lights flickered and you could hear a low humming noise like a train in the distance. It was that close. The four of us were hunkered down in the hallway and the tornado narrowly missed us. The damage was less than a mile away. When we were in the thick of it, waiting in the hall, I once again was left wondering if we were going to be safe. We're going to be okay. Then just this past March, when I was in Arkansas at this pastor's conference, I was confronted with my fear once more. We were told that storms were going to be really bad one of the nights we were there and to stay weather aware. I set my phone to receive updates from the National Weather Service in Little Rock, and as the storms approached our area, they sent an image out with a map in a small area circled in red. It was more than just a tornado watch or warning. The area was labeled in big, red, bold letters, strong tornado expected in this area within the next hour. Of course, right in the center of that area was the conference center where we were staying. Well, the camp is in a lovely location, and I have wonderful things to say about it. It's an old camp, and you can tell that the walls of the buildings are not super sturdy. So as the sirens went off, I went down from my room on the second floor to one of the rooms of another attendee on the first floor, and we buried ourselves in a corner of a room with a mattress shielding us with the local news on my iPad. A tornado was on the ground and heading straight for us, and I mean straight for us. The meteorologist even said that it was heading straight for Ferncliff Road, which was the same road where the camp was located. You could see that as they zoomed in on the map that it was literally headed straight for the camp. Our ears even popped as the pressure changed, and I was left wondering once again, are we going to be okay? I prayed so unbelievably hard. But not long before the tornado approached the camp, it dissipated. As quickly as it came, it went away just as fast. It's interesting that when literal storms happen in my life, when I'm faced with a storm that leaves me wondering if me and my loved ones will be okay, even though so many times I've been shown the evidence that we likely will be, I still fear the worst. I still question everything. I still have my doubts. Yet this questioning begins with hard scientific evidence. 
It's rooted in maps and science and physical phenomena. Which makes me wonder, is our story today really about someone needing the cold, hard facts? Or does it communicate something deeper about our faith? Like, I'm not suggesting we throw facts and science out the window. They still matter. I think it's good to be weather aware. You better believe that I'm going to stay off the roads when severe storms approach and to make decisions in the best interest of safety. But maybe physical evidence isn't all it's cracked up to be. Because all of us will face storms in life, whether they have to do with weather or a diagnosis or a loss or something else traumatic. Even as Christians, when we have the proof, we can still turn to doubting and wondering if we're going to be okay. We can turn to fear and unbelief. In the post-resurrection world, it's easy to return to the same old fears and doubts we've always had as humans. Just like it happens in this passage, it happens in our lives. But when we put our full trust, the kind that believes in the power of new life week after week, the kind that proclaims the hope found in the risen Lord, we can have the confidence that all will still be okay. It doesn't mean that our wounds aren't real or that we're flawed so we can't continue to be followers for having doubts and fears it just means we need a reminder from time to time that all is well with our souls we need moments small moments where we are struck by the profound reality of what this power of resurrection means the further we get away from it we need to remember the power of resurrection on the Sunday after Easter Sunday and the Sunday after that and so on. We need reminders that the one who received new life also gives new life. In our text today, it says that he breathed new life on us as the disciples received the Holy Spirit. But it begs the question, where do we find the reminders? How can we find that deeper faith. I'm reminded of all my experiences with severe weather. The night of that tornado in Gerald, my parents let me and my brother sleep in their room that night. The night of that tornado in Dallas, I was huddled together with my wife and her parents as the storm narrowly missed us. The night of that tornado in Arkansas, a fellow pastor was kind enough to allow me to come downstairs and hunker down on the lowest level of the building to be as safe as we could be. Each time I was faced with the power of these storms, the eye of the storm was closer and closer to my physical location. But each time I also had someone there to go through it with me. And I'll tell you too that each time I felt a little less fear, I doubted a little less that all would be okay even though each experience brought me closer and closer to my fear. That's what this passage is all about, that even when it feels like we can't see it, Jesus is still near. And if we have trouble believing in that reality, just look to one another. That's the power of resurrection hope as the body of Christ. It's why community is so important. It means we don't have to face the storms of this life alone. It means we have people to go through it with us. So I encourage you, join the Bible study or small group you've been thinking about joining. Find community here at Grace or somewhere else. If you need help finding a place, just let me know and I'll work to help get you connected. Find your siblings in Christ who will help you to know the power of resurrection hope. You can see it everywhere here, in our prayer team, in our deacons and elders, our committees, in the mission work we're doing, in our worship. Seeing God's love in action, it's all over the place. Maybe it's not always the physical evidence that some of us skeptics hope for, but it's certainly visible. All you have to do is take a step back and trust. Because in the body of Christ, when we truly trust in God and each other, when we truly rely on one another and trust God's plan for our lives and our communities, barriers are broken and bridges are built. 
God works with us and through us. We become the hands and feet of Christ in all that we do. Trusting in God, believing in the power of resurrection isn't some checkbox to get us tickets into the pearly gates. Trusting in the power of resurrection changes things. It changes lives, it changes us, it changes our neighbors, and it changes the world. You know, there's a deeper reason that I titled my sermon the Sunday after Easter Sunday, and not just the and not just the Sunday after Easter. It's because we are still in the season of Easter. We're still in the season where we celebrate the power of resurrection. And it got me thinking, does this season really end? Does Easter ever really cease? I don't really think it does. As Christians, we are Easter people who continue to see and perpetuate new life in all that we do. So when we find ourselves in the valleys of doubt, may we look for resurrection hope in one another. It's all the proof we need to know God's love. It's all the proof we need that resurrection is alive and well. We just finished our sermon series on signs in the Gospel of John. Maybe there was one more sign detailing the power of God's love. Through believing, may we have life in his name. May it be so. Amen.